What is the prime mover in the back squat? In this video, you will learn what is the prime mover in a back squat or what are prime movers in a back squat, the differences between agonists, synergists and antagonists, and I discuss how much changing the foot position and the stance will change the muscular activation and the prime movers in a back squat. What is the prime mover in a back squat? So when we think about prime movers, most of the times we think about muscles. However, I've discussed in previous videos that my approach is more looking at movements rather than muscles. Um, there is a nice saying of train movements, not muscles. And this approach can also help us if we look at the prime mover in a back squat. So let's look at what movements occur in a back squat and then we see which muscles or muscle groups are responsible for that movement. What is the prime movement in the back squat? Well, very simply, if we look at the back squat, we can definitely see in the beginning of the descent, so when we go down, we can see a hip flexion, a knee flexion, and to a certain extent an ankle flexion. And in the ascent, so coming back up, we see a hip extension, a knee extension, and an ankle extension. Now the question is, what are the prime movers that make these movements possible? So, hip flexion and extension, knee flexion and extension, and ankle flexion and extension. And we also need to understand what are antagonistic muscles, synergistic muscles, and agonistic muscles. So let's start with agonistic muscles, that's the easiest to understand. Agonistic muscles are actually the ones that do the prime movement. Synergistic muscles are the ones that support the prime movement, that work in synergy. And antagonistic muscles are actually the muscles that are opposed to the prime movement. Simple example of a very popular example of a biceps curl. So if flexing the arm, flexing the arm is the prime movement, the biceps mainly works. The antagonistic muscle is the muscle that extends the arm, which is the muscle on the other side of the upper arm, the triceps. So let's look how that unfolds for a more complex movement like a back squat where more than one joint is involved. Let's look at the agonist. So if we look at the agonistic muscles of the hip flexion and extension, there will be the gluteal muscles, so the gluteus maximus. If we look at the knee flexion and extension, there's mainly the quads or the quadriceps. The quadriceps is a muscle group that consists out of four muscles, the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. Whilst the three vasti muscles are only for knee flexion and extension, the rectus femoris goes over two joints and is also involved a little bit in the hip flexion and extension. Antagonistic muscles for the ankle flexion and extension. There are two muscles that work on the ankle and that is the soleus and the gastrocnemius. The soleus again is one muscle that spans over one joint so and is responsible for flexion and extension of the ankle. The gastroc is a muscle that goes over two joints and that is one the flexion and extension of the muscle but it also goes over the joint of the knee which is responsible for flexion and extension to a certain extent of the knee. The synergistic muscles are adductors and abductors. My hand movement was just off, so adductors that bring the legs in and abductors that bring the legs out. <laughs> the adductors and abductors are also a group of muscles, so more than just one muscle. As well as the hamstring, I know there's a bit of a debate how much the hamstring is actually involved in the squat, but it does work as a synergist and it also has been shown that the hamstring in running, especially high-speed running, is a muscle that assists knee extension, so not only knee flexion. Consequently, the same is true for the back squat, so it can help assist the knee extension. Hamstring, again, these are three different muscles. The biceps femoris that goes over two joints, so knee joint and hip joint, and the semimembranosus and semitendinosus that goes over one joint, which is just the knee joint and responsible for the knee flexion. And we should also not forget the tibialis anterior, so which is the muscle on the front 
of the lower leg that also helps to stabilize the lower leg in the squatting movement. Talking about stabilizers, so what about stabilizers? How important are stabilizers? Well, we talked about the active part, so hip flexion, extension, knee flexion, extension, and ankle flexion and extension, but only that is possible when you have the bar on your back that the stabilizers work efficiently in order to make this movement possible. And therefore, the stabilizers are mainly activated isometrically, so without movement, in order to make the movement for the prime movers possible. So what are these stabilizers? Well, we have to think about the trunk. The trunk has to work very, very hard in order to maintain a good upper body position. So trunk being the erector spinae, the big muscle on the back of the lower back, so the lower back, the abdominals to a certain extent, but also the deeper lying trunk muscles in order to make the valsalva maneuver possible. So the valsalva maneuver is the moment when you hold your breath, which creates intra-abdominal pressure and helps you to lift higher loads and stabilize the spine. So yes, the trunk muscles are important. We talked about core stability before. However, core stability are not the prime movers in the back squat, even though some people might want to tell you that. But the lower trunk muscles are important for stabilizing the spine. The valsalva maneuver which allows you to lift higher loads, if you know how to perform it correctly. What about other stabilizers? Well, in order to have the bar on your back and support the bar on your back, you need to have a strong back. So if we look at, our, at some of my athletes, the track cyclists, this is exactly the reason why we do upper body training. It's not so much that they need a up, bigger upper body. Actually, the opposite is true because you want to be streamlined. However, if you want to squat 200 plus kilos, you need to have an upper body to support that weight. And therefore, which muscles are important? Well, it's definitely the traps where the bar lies on. It's also the rhomboids, the posterior shoulder, the scapula muscles, and the latissimus. And in order to understand that concept a little bit better, I really like the cue from Dave Tate. I'm not sure whether it comes from Dave Tate or whether he repeated it. But Dave Tate from Elite FTS and he when he spoke about the importance of the back in the back squat, he kind of gave the cue that you need to put the back under tension from all four hemispheres. Yeah, so if you think about it, top, bottom, and side, I think that's a very good analogy of the importance of the back in the squatting movement, and then also the muscular activation that makes that possible. Top top down, bottom up, and then laterally in. Okay, one more thing about foot position. It's very often argued that changing the foot position or changing stance alters or changes muscular activation. What is my take on it? Well, it is true. It has been shown in studies that that is true. However, the way I approach it, I wouldn't worry too much about foot position for the simple reason is that you need to find a stance and a foot position that allows you to squat comfortably and safely and enables you to lift the highest load. The main driver for adaptation, strength and hypertrophy is the load. So the more load you can squat, the higher the chance for muscular hypertrophy and strength. And if you look, for example, coming back to the example of my track cyclists, none of them worry too much about their foot position and everyone has pretty big legs and that's a result of the loads they are able to squat so if you're concerned with building strength or building mass and size in the legs i would not worry too much about foot positions i would much rather worry about which stance enables you to squat comfortably and safely and allows you to progress loads over time. To wrap it up, what is the prime mover in a back squat? A simple approach, if you look at the movement that occurs, hip flexion and extension, knee flexion and extension, ankle flexion and extension, we need to look at the muscles that enable that movement. We need to look at agonistic muscles and synergistic muscles. We also have to have a look at the stabilizers that make the movement possible. Which movement was it? Hip flexion and extension, knee flexion and extension, ankle flexion and extension. Last but not least, the foot position 
and the stance. So feet out, feet in, parallel, whatever, wider stance, closer stance. Yes, it does have an influence on muscular activation. However, that is very, very little. The main driver for strength gains and mass gains is the intensity and the time under tension. So the mechanical load that is put on the muscle as, as well as the time under tension, the time under that mechanical load. So whatever allows you to lift the highest load comfortably and safely, that should be your stance. Now over to you. What do you think about foot position? Feet in, feet out, wide stance, close stance, muscular activation. Put it in the comments below. And also if there's anything I have not covered and, that, and which is not fully clear from that explanation, please also put it in the comments below. I will do my best to answer it.